Hey friends, welcome to unit six. Congratulations, you've smashed the previous units. I'm assuming you've done the challenges. You're continuing to do the challenges. In this unit, we're talking about boundaries. Why are we talking about boundaries in a course designed to treat anxiety, fear, and panic? Well, let's start by defining what a boundary is. A boundary is simply a set limit. It's a set limit that creates a sense of safety that may be physical safety, emotional safety, verbal, sexual, financial. The idea of a boundary is a safe and protected space. Right? It can be spoken or unspoken. You know, you have physical boundaries. They may not be spoken. Like if I sit too close to you on a park bench, that's uncomfortable. That's an unspoken boundary that you sense and feel in your body. So I want you to think in your mind of a ranch. Picture like a farm or ranch and there's a there's a wired fence around the ranch that keeps the cattle and the livestock safe from the wolves. It keeps them in, but it keeps them safe from the, woods, from the wolves. It also keeps the property protected from other intruders that might want to come and steal your cattle. The point again is protection and safety. What happens if there's a break in the fence line? What happens if wolves get over the fence? Well, chaos ensues. The sheep begin to get slaughtered. Blood is spilt, right? Remember, anytime, going back to the previous units, anytime anxiety is present, it simply means that we perceive a threat. So our nervous system is picking up on a threat, whether that's perceived or real. <clears throat> when our boundaries are intruded upon, we will feel threatened. We will feel anxious. We will feel off kilter. So many of us are anxious because we have crap boundaries. And I've got four categories I want to discuss with you. These are common patterns that I see with the clients that I work with. And I've personally experienced some of these myself. So number one category, work. What do you mean, Jonathan? What do you mean by work? Well, years ago I had a, a boss. Uh, I was hired with the company. I was working with the company. I've been with the company for about two months and we sat down and over coffee and the, the boss began to explain to me, hey, listen, so I know we, you know, you signed down for 40 hours, but really this position is more of a 60 to 80 hour position. It's just the way this company works. Now, I have a previous commitment to my family. I love my wife, I love my kids. So I, I was assertive with them and I set the boundary right up. I said, listen, I respect where you're coming from. We did not discuss this when I got hired. Uh, I am willing to give you 40 hours a week, not 60 not 80, uh, for the pay that I'm receiving. Um, but I'll tell you what, I'll give you everything I got for that 40 hours. As long as my family life is good, I'll be good for the company. If my family life is bad, I won't be good for the company. So that was me, that was me setting boundaries with the boss right out of the gate. Long story short, it didn't end up working out. <laughs> but I, was, I, had to set, I had to set my boundary. I couldn't, I couldn't bend to his will in that, in that moment because I had other core values and other priorities. And some of you can relate to that in your workspace. Uh, they have expectations of you and they press you and they push you into those expectations and you find yourself anxious and stressed. Well, if you can't hold your fence line um, for whatever reason, you're gonna ex expect the wolves to get in. Expect inner chaos. Know your limits. Some of you, by the way, you're so competent and you're so intelligent that your boss sees you and he hands you or she hands you more work because they know you can get the job done. The problem is if you've got too much on your plate, like being overloaded is going to cause stress. In fact, a, a good definition of stress is when the demands exceed your capacity, right? So if I'm holding two basketballs and you, hold, you try to hand me a third basketball, I don't, it's like, it's too much for me. I, I, I can't handle that. Poor analogy, but... You get my drift. Decide how many hours. You gotta decide how many hours you're willing to put in. You've got to decide how many emails you're willing to check throughout the day, throughout the work day. <clears throat> Move, moving on, now that I mentioned emails, moving on to the second category, technology hygiene. Why do you bathe frequently? Well, you bathe because you begin to stink, some of you more than others. Why do we need to limit technology? Because if we're constantly in go mode, our parasympathetic system never gets to turn off, never gets to rest. Our brains need a reset. 
It's like we need time to come off the mountain and to recalibrate. Rest and recovery is essential for productivity. It's kind of like taking a hot shower refreshes you. It, it helps your muscles to relax. We need to turn off the technology, right, so that our sympathetic system can begin to shut off and we can move into that rest and digest system. Here's a few examples of, that you might want to implement. When I get home, I have a habit of shutting my, my phone off, putting on airplane mode or shutting it off and putting it on the counter. That way, I'm you know, less tempted to go and check it, and I'm committed to disconnecting and being with my wife and my children. Uh, I have certain set hours during the day where I check emails. People don't always have access to me. I'm not responding to emails 24-7. There's certain parts of the day where I will do that. This takes some discipline, by the way. I set limits on the TV, the amount of TV that I watch, especially before bed. You need to come up with what works for you, but any sleep expert will tell you blue light and technology before bed is bad for your sleep rhythm. You're not going to sleep great. In fact, I spent about five months in Africa without an iPad or iPhone or anything. When I returned, I had watched like zero television. When I returned, one night, like the first night I was back, I tried to watch some television before bed and my mind was so stimulated, I didn't sleep the entire night. It's like it, get, it got revved up. The blue light actually really affects things. Music, by the way, the right, the right music can help you relax. The wrong music with the wrong lyrics and the wrong beats will amp you. Be careful with that. Third category, family. How, how do you allow your family to speak to you? There are verbal boundaries. People should not be able to speak to you in a particular way. There's a way to be respectful in tone and physiology and with our words. Some of our family are so used to us, they speak to us in a disrespectful manner. This may sting for some of you. Some of you need to cut financial strings because it gives family connection. It gives family attachment to you. It gives family control over you. So some of you have left the home. You're married. You've got your own kids, but you're still getting money from mom and dad. Now, that in and of itself is not bad, but... Typically, money comes with obligations. And we need to be able to cut those strings so that we're free, we're utterly free. So there's no one's got any kind of control over us. I, I meet with client after client after client. They wanna have less anxiety and I challenge them, hey, you've gotta cut, cut the strings, you've gotta cut the safety net and they just won't do it. So they're obligated to take the phone calls, they're obligated to do what dad says or mom says at the drop of a hat. You can see how this causes problems. Is your family allowed to stop over anytime they want? The answer should be no. Just like you shouldn't stop at someone's house anytime you want. <clears throat> Some of you have family members, when they come to visit, they bring their house rules into your house and you're not being assertive enough and setting verbal boundaries and letting them know what your house rules are. So they just come in and dominate. And there's a way to do this respectfully and tactfully, but hey, here's our house rules. This is kind of how we do things um, in this house. Um, we'd like you to, to follow those rules. That's, that's our expectation. Some of you also allow your parents or your in-laws or your siblings to have unlimited access to you via text or phone call. No one should have unlimited access to you except perhaps your best, best friend or your spouse. That's about it. You don't need to be on call, all right? You need to recalibrate and take some breaks. Lastly, friends and neighbors. That's the last category that we'll talk about. How much emotional content are people allowed to share with you? You know, like I have a boundary with you. If I've never met you and you come and sit with me on some park bench and you start to spill your heart, we don't have any kind of rapport. You don't know me, I don't know you, and you're spilling on me. That's uncomfortable for me. Well, guess what? When you do that to other people and when other people do that to you, you're gonna feel off kilter. You might even feel anxious, okay? It's important to be able to verbally say, hey, you know what? Um, I'm not really all that comfortable with you saying that to me. I, you know, I'd like to maybe know you a little bit better. Some people are too touchy. I'm gonna get to that in a second, but I had an instance where somebody was touching me repeatedly and I started to feel uncomfortable with it. I had to bring that up. I'll circle back to that in a minute. 
<clears throat> some people come over and they overstay their welcome and you feel awkward and irritable and anxious. It's your job to, when, before they get there, hey, so you're arriving at two, hey, so um, I've got something to do at four o'clock, so I've got a two hour span where you can come visit. You can hold that boundary there. The idea is that you're being assertive. See, boundaries don't work if you're not willing to engage discomfort and willing to be assertive. Now, remember, what do we begin to feel when our boundaries are violated? When the fence is overrun, we begin to feel threatened and anxious. So a few years ago, we had a neighbor, and this neighbor uh, was verbally very aggressive with everyone in the community, including UPS drivers and my babysitter. And one day he got really verbally aggressive with my wife. So obviously as a husband, that's going to uh, upset me. So she calls me, tells me what happens. And you know, I've, I've got all day to think about it. And when I got home, I walked over to his house, knocked on his door, and I assertively began to explain to him that he was not allowed to speak to my wife that way. From that, from that day forward, he would, he would directly speak with me. I gave him a business card and let him know tactfully, respectfully, but firmly, you speak with me and me alone. She's off limits. That's the boundary. All right, I'm setting a verbal boundary. And uh, you know, from that day forward, it really shifted things. He's, he was no angel, but it did help a lot. And we were able to kind of reestablish a boundary line. It's like I went and put up the fence post and put it back together uh, to a degree. So consider those four categories. I want you to stop the video, get in touch with work, technology, family, friends, neighbors. When it comes to boundaries, listen, we don't actually get to control what other people do. We get to control ourselves. So here's an example. Bob, if you speak to me in that tone again, then I'm going to walk away. Here's another example. Years ago, I was in this social setting and this woman approached me and she was irritable and anxious and I could just feel it coming off of her. And I'm sure you've had a similar experience to a degree. As she's talking, she starts touching my shoulder over repeatedly, over and over, like nervously, like putting her hand on me and I was feeling really uncomfortable. I don't really know this woman. Let's call her Veronica. And so I actually got to the point where I was feeling so uncomfortable. I said, Veronica, can I, can I stop you? I don't know if you're noticing, but you keep touching me and you're very close to me and I feel really uncomfortable. Could you take a step back? If you can take a step back, I'd be happy to continue this conversation. And I'll tell you, it felt really uncomfortable while she was touching me, but it also felt really uncomfortable to hold that boundary, that verbal boundary, and to tell her that I was feeling uncomfortable. But I'll tell you this, some people will intrude on your boundary unless you take a stand. Some people aren't, they lack self-awareness. Uh, some people are just uh, more disagreeable. That's a, that's a term out of the big five personality scale, which means that they'd be willing to elbow you in the face to get, get what they want. They know what they want, they're, get, they're gonna get it at, at cost to you. And, and that's just a personality trait, it doesn't make them evil. But some people are like that, some people have poor self-awareness and poor social skills. It's incumbent upon us to know what our boundaries are and to be able to express them to other people because other people cannot read your mind. Another example, years ago uh, in a clinical setting, I had a client who um, asked me to sign some documentation for him uh, for the court system and it would have been falsifying documentation. So of course I had to say, no, that's, I can't do that. That's uh, blatantly wrong, it's unethical, I can't do that. Well, he was brewing on that for a few days and. A few days later, he approaches me in the lobby in front of other clients and other colleagues and begins to scream at me and just make a scene. Spits flying, he's up in my face. <clears throat> and uh, let's call him, uh, we'll call him Bert. And you know, I, I had the sense of mind while I was feeling threatened. Of course, the adrenaline's flowing, my heart's racing, and my, my hands are clammy. Started brain fog starting to hit, but before that, before that, I was able to get these words out. I said, I said, Bert, here's the deal. If you can lower your tone and, and speak to me in a respectful manner, I'd be happy to continue this conversation. But I'm feeling like you're really not hearing me right now. And he starts screaming even louder and spits flying. I mean, spits landing on me. And I'm feeling really, I'm feeling like he's gonna punch me. So I said, 
All right, I, like I laid out my verbal boundary and then I said, all right, this conversation is over. If, if and when you are ready to lower your voice and speak in a respectful manner, I'd be, happy to, I'd be happy to circle back with you. And I just backed away, slowly expecting a punch. Never got one, thank God. But the idea here was I held a verbal boundary and then I removed myself because I can't control you. You can't control them. It's our job to control ourselves. We have to be the ones that express our boundaries. People will test them. When you give people verbal boundaries, they will test them, especially family and friends, because they're used to getting their way. And when we set a, when we set a line, expect that people are going to push the boundary. Now, did you know that when you say yes to something, when you say yes to something, you're saying no to something. So, simple example, if you say yes to staying up late tonight, you're probably saying no to getting up early to go to the gym or spend some alone time. If you say yes to that work affair with that woman, you're saying no to your spouse at home and no to that relationship and possibly no forever and possibly no to your children. If you say yes to laziness and apathy, you're saying no to money and income and progress. So understand, anytime you say yes to something, you're saying no to something. Little tip, some of you really struggle to say no, and it's wreaking all kinds of resentment and anxiety and stress in your life. When, like, so let me give you an example. When you, let's say your, your friend asks you to help them move out of their apartment this Saturday, but you know they ask you, and you're a generous person, but you had already planned to spend time with your immediate family and have a nice dinner and... And, and that was your only day off for the, for the last 14 days. You've been working really hard. This is the only day you had planned to be off and be with your family. But out of the generosity of your heart, you say, you know what? Yes, I'll help you move. Now, you show up on Saturday and you're helping them move out of their apartment. Meanwhile, you're feeling bitter and resentful and you're grumbling underneath your breath because you actually don't want to be there. You're feeling irritable and anxious. That, woke, that day you wake up anxious because you don't want to go. You said yes when you should have said no. That is a recipe for resentment, stress, and anxiety. When you say yes, when you ought to say no, expect anxiety and resentment. Some of us need to learn to use some of these phrases. You know, I have this, this habit. When somebody asks me to do something or they, they ask, they want to hang out, they want to meet up, I'll say, hey, you know what? Let me get back to you in a few hours. Let me circle back with you. Or let me get back with you in 24 hours. Let me speak with my wife. I'll circle back with you after I check my schedule. And what that does is, I'm not over committing myself in the moment. I'm giving myself some, a little time out to go, even if it's five minutes ago, okay, if I say yes to this, what am I saying no to? And it actually gives me more peace, and that way I can actually give a confident answer. I may check my schedule, and I may be open, I may be free, and I go, out of the generosity of my heart, I go, yeah. Out of the charity in my spirit, I go, yeah, I'd, I'd love to meet up. I'd love to help with that. Cool. But at least take the time out. That phrase is, I'll circle back with you after I check my schedule or after I speak with my spouse. <clears throat> now, I want to I close by saying, and saying this and challenging you with this. Don't, <laughs> this is going to sound funny, don't hang out with people out of obligation. <clears throat> don't say yes when you really mean no. Like, think about it this way. I don't want you to go get coffee with me out of obligation. I want you to go get coffee with me because you want to. I don't want my wife to make love to me out of obligation. I want my wife to make love to me because she wants to. Right? As an employer, you don't want your employees to show up because they have to. You want them to show up because they actually like the work environment, they like the type of work, and they want to be there. Right? The idea is that we don't, we don't do things out of obligation. And by obligation, by the way, I mean when we're, when we're doing something that we don't want to do <clears throat> because we're afraid that somebody's going to be upset with us or think less of us. So in that case of helping the friend move over the weekend, one of the reasons that maybe I didn't say no is because I'm afraid that if I say no, they're going to think less of me. They're going to they're think I'm selfish. And I don't want them to be upset with me. 
So I, I say yes because I have a subtle fear of rejection. Okay? Um, now, if that sounds mean, get over it. <laughs> we don't do things out of obligation. We do things out of duty. What, what I mean by duty is when you follow through, you're following through on a previous commitment no matter how you feel. So if you previously committed to that friend four months ago, you said, I will help you on this date. Duty says, I will follow through on my word <clears throat> because that was something I previously committed to a while back. Okay, um, If you have a duty at your job, it's like I committed to this job I committed to helping this company. I committed to my clients. That is a priority, okay? So duty and obligation are different. Obligation, again, is when I do something I don't want to do because I'm, a, because I'm afraid that I'll upset that person or, the, or the, they will think less of me. Now, moving into the challenge, I want you to take one week. This is, this is difficult for some of you. Take one week and, and do nothing out of obligation. You're going to stop and check in with yourself. You're going to get clear on your duties and you're going to stick to your guns. You're going to ask yourself, like, if I say yes to this, what, what am I saying no to? If I say yes to checking these emails at 11.30 at night, what am I saying no to? If I say yes to my boss in this area, what, am I, what other project am I saying no to? Now, I realize some of this might sound easier than it really is. I realize this is difficult this is something that you're implementing and practicing. Secondly, I want you to practice this journaling assignment. I want you to write down, just get a scratch piece of paper and just, where am I feeling violated? This is the question. Where am I feeling violated, underappreciated, or taken advantage of? This is going to help you narrow down your resentments and your stress and anxiety. Where am I feeling violated, underappreciated, and taken advantage of? And secondly, this is a big one. What resentments am I harboring? Right now, uh, what resentments am I harboring? I want you to get in touch with that. And, and you know, people, I, I do this with clients and they go, I don't really have any resentments. And then they sit down with a notebook and they really get quiet and they'll come back with three pages of resentments. I, that may not be you, okay? But we need to stop and get in touch with what's going on inside. Um, and by the way, if you do find that you have some resentment, by the way, resentment happens oftentimes when we say yes to something when we should have said no to something. If you find that you do have resentments, these are your three options. You can assertively confront the issue. If it's a boss that you have a resentment with, you can figure out a healthy, assertive way to confront the issue. You can also overlook the offense and work, do the hard work of forgiveness. You know, Maybe they may not ask for forgiveness, but the important part is we're doing the hard work of extending forgiveness because we don't want to carry around that burden of resentment. And thirdly, some of us are resentful and bitter and upset about something, and we really just kind of need to admit that we were being childish and we need to grow up and just take that off the shelf. So sometimes resentment is a sign that we're being immature and we need to just admit that we're being a little bit hypersensitive. Again, the three are assertive confrontation, forgiveness, the hard work of forgiveness, or admitting that you maybe were a bit immature and it's time to grow up. Good luck with the challenges, guys. I'm excited to hear feedback from you. 